gone from 1936 from Germany, you have radar equipment made by Wood. Uh, in, 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 from 1943, you have. And it's pronounced Nike. You never know what you're going to find sticking out of it. Yes. Nice and now cannon. Secondary armament. Yes. Big guns. Yes. Piece of history. Yes. Must go touch. Yes. Ah, oh, what a beautiful gun. Oh, what an awesome piece of machinery. Except, of course, if you were on the receiving end. I'm so glad at least this part of the great ship was survived. Piece by piece, taken apart, installed, then after the war, piece by piece, removed, restored, rebuilt here for the Cold War fort, fighting off Russian minesweepers. Yes. Needs a bit of paint. I'll be happy to spend my summer doing that. Do a rust, rust -oleum. There's something about big guns that are just fascinating. It's just awesome. Fire control. The armor attached. After the Second World War had ended, it was only a few years later before it became apparent to the Allies that the Russians had no intention of leaving the countries they had occupied during the war. And after the formation of the NATO Pact, the Western Transatlantic Alliance, created in order to counter the Russian-Soviet bloc countries alliance and their threat to the Western countries. The country with its eastern frontier closest to Russia, short of Germany, was Denmark, now a member of NATO as well. It had seen the growing Cold War with concern. The Danish government in 1948 chose then to construct two large forts, mostly underground, at the easternmost point of the country as point guards. Denmark had to fund the bill themselves entirely with no help from NATO, as the small country had refused to buy some of the new mobile equipment the US wanted to sell them. They simply did not have the money after the Second World War and thus the fort was built for only 15 million Danish kroner in 1951. In today's dollars, that would be only about 28 million, still quite cheap. Now besides the sea fort and its cannons, here was also located an Air Force missile defense system. Nike and later Hawk missile systems were introduced here. Denmark had refused to have nuclear weapons on its soil, but nuclear warheads were located just south of the German border and would be deployed here when, or if, the US determined so in time. It had also had 150mm howitzers here capable of firing nuclear shells, tactical warheads. How to defend the immediate seaways? There were two huge battleship guns installed and used until the fort was finally closed only some 20 years ago and the Danes did take quite a bit of inspiration and materials from old German bunker construction, and we'll see that shortly. The battleships Neisenau and Scharnhorst was laid down in Kiel in 1935, launched in 1938, with its main armament being nine 28 centimeter guns, that's 11 inches. They wanted larger, but that would need a reconfiguration of the ship that we'll try later. Neisenau and Scheinhorst operated together for much of the early portions of World War II, including sorties into the Atlantic to raid British merchant shipping. During their first operation, the two ships sank a British auxiliary cruiser in a short battle. Neisenau and Scharnhorst participated in Operation Visible, the German invasion of Norway. During operations off Norway, the two ships engaged the battlecruiser HMS Renown and sank the aircraft carrier HMS Glorious. Neisenau was damaged in the action with Renown and later torpedoed by a British submarine off Norway. 
After a successful raid in the Atlantic in 1941, Gneisenau and her sister ship put into Brest and France. The two battleships were then subject to repeated bombing raids by the RF. Gneisenau was hit several times during the raid, but was ultimately repaired. The ship made a dash through the channel and made it to dock in Kiel. Here, both ships were severely bombed again. The damage to the Gneisenau was so extensive, it was ordered rebuilt in order to take the main larger guns. Triple turrets had stalled were removed and positioned in positions on the Atlantic Wall, those we will visit later. They are still in place. In 1943, Hitler ordered all battleship construction halted, and its arms were removed. Later the ship was sunk as a block ship in 1945. And the ship's secondary armament, 12 15cm guns, were also removed and installed in the Atlantic Wall. These we are now so fortunate as to be able to visit here in this Danish fort, married to an old American targeting radar system, oddly enough. I am at a Cold War fortress in Denmark to guard against the Russians. It's roughly that way. But several of the guns from the Gneisenau, when they were removed from the ship, they went to the Atlantic Wall here in Denmark, after which these two turrets were placed here in Denmark to guide against the Russians. And now, let's go have a look at this area because this is a fascinating place with a lot of cool Cold War displays, but still, a lot of underground bunkers, a lot of underground hallways, World War II cannon munitions, and that's what we're here for, isn't it? Between the two main cannons, what we see is one smaller, still 15 centimeter cannon that was not installed for effect, but for lighting. Of course, also a World War II issue. The main guns could also be operated visually, not just by radar. So in order to do this and utilize firing at night, they would have starlight shells being fired from this that would illuminate the area to the same distance that the shells would fall for visual inspection and targeting of enemy ships. In 1957, originally a 12.7 centimeter cannon for firing light grenades was set up here. That cannon was replaced with this one in the early 1960s, this a 15 centimeter cannon, with a range of 23 kilometers. Where this exact cannon comes from is still unknown, but of course it is of German manufacture. It is possible that it is a German SKC-28 that was left behind in a coastal battery after the occupation. These were placed elsewhere in Denmark during the war. So this is where they prepare illuminating shells. Have the ammo storage, had the cannon here. Another ammo storage. This was a 15 centimeter cannon. World War II 15 centimeter cannon. It's a really cool display of how you'd set up Cold War surveillance radar. Of course, you'd have everything on trailers because if the Cold War turned hot, first thing you'd do is move all the soldiers and everything out of the barracks into the woods where they could be in safety. Because, of course, as here in Denmark, Everybody knew that the Russians had pre-sighted all the barracks, all the, all the fortifications we had. So if the Cold War turned hot, all the soldiers would move out into the forest immediately and bring all their gear and set up with them. Displays here from Cold War weaponry, missiles, air-to-air -air rockets, radars, rangefinders. It's a very, very cool place to visit. I'm just looking forward to seeing the old World War II guns. It was a Cold War fort, and it's run by some of the people that was actually stationed here during the war, which is really cool. You get good stories. Well, my name is Brian, and I've been on duty on this uh, fort, uh, Stones Fort, from uh, 80 to 81. That was a part of my, my duty in the Navy, where, where I was originally educated on, on torpedo fire control. And it was 
during some exciting years of the Cold War with the Polish crisis and whatever happened out in the in the Baltic Sea. Uh, it was a very close encounter sometimes. We could spit on the side deck <laughs> and see the white in the, in the eyes. Uh, there was a lot of of uh, cheating each other with, with, with maneuvers and all that. The Nisenau is one of the few remaining ships that wasn't really sunk, it was just heavily damaged. So all the munitions and weaponry was taken off and placed in various positions from Denmark to Norway. So this is really one of the remaining surviving bits of German naval architecture, which is, makes it very rare and very rather special. And this looks like felted camouflage, and it is. And I don't know if there was any revisions made for this for the Cold War. But the whole cannon well underneath still exists. Yeah. Oh, yes. Everything's where it's supposed to be. Except the door's not open, and, and that just seems wrong so many ways and what a beautifully restored turret this is this is just awesome everything is where it's supposed to be the shells are here guns are here and of course some range control help from a more modern era but this is just a beautiful turret. I love the speaking tubes, but they still yell orders to each other. And it really looks like the, the complete turret is here. Full elevation, everything. Absolutely awesome. It is very special to see what remains of this great ship. Imagine what would have happened if the Bismarck had been scrapped and its guns were sitting somewhere. The SKC-28 guns were stationed here, especially against minesweepers and to stop amphibious landings. Although a 15 centimeter cannon will do quite a bit of damage to a landing craft if you can hit it. These two towers we have here at Stemsford uh, was placed uh, at Fanø, uh, a small island uh, just beside uh, Esbjerg Harbor and was uh, intended to prevent an invasion through Esbjerg Harbor uh, from the English. In this gun there is uh, a crew of about 53 persons. Uh, they are 15 here in the tower and they are some in uh, the uh, technical platform just below here. And then they have to move the ammunition from one, ele one elevator to another elevator because the tower can move. Uh, so that is all done by hand and down in the magazine they prepare the, the grenades with uh, fuses and, and take out the uh, 
the propellant charge, uh, they are separate for these guns. So it's a lot of heavy work to do when, when they are shooting. Um, the 15 people up here is uh, laying the gun uh, in, in the side angle and, and, and up and down. The uh, commander sitting here communicating with the artillery central. Uh, and the other ones are putting grenades and, and, and propellant charges into the gun. And it's done by, by hand. It, will, it, it weighs about uh, 43 kilos. Uh, one man takes a grenade into the barrel uh, and then they uh, stamp it with, uh, with these ones up here to get it tight in the barrel. Then the propellant charts, then they close the, the, uh, the uh, barrel and uh, puts up the gun. And then he says, shot ready. They will play, apply back in some time, fire, and then you push the bottom. The guns move backwards, backwards uh, about a meters or something like that. And then again, the holster from the, from the propellant charge out as a tower, new grenade and so on. Uh, but this procedure is taking only about 10 seconds. The, the, the goal was to fire six shots a minute in the Danish Navy. Uh, the German Navy said eight shots a minute. So it was quite heavy work in here, and then a day like this, I don't know the temperature in here, but it's hot. <laughs> so did they, was this modernized in any way no. for the Cold War? No, it's not controlled, uh, automatic or anything. Uh, the two guys outside there, which was just laying the gun in the side, and, and, and the uh, angle is, is uh, in contact with, with the artillery central by, by uh, microphone and ear pieces, and they tell them what angle should the gun stand in. So they just follow the information from, from the artillery center uh, and not taking care of anything else in here. That was their job just to, to lay the gun. So they literally moved the entire turret, well first up to Fanu and then here, down here, yeah. and now it, it looks exactly as it sat on the ship. The sign says uh, with Danish uh, language on, on all of them, but if you dismount them and look at the back side, it's in German. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess if the Germans ever come back, they could just flip the signs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> These guns are made from Rheinland's Held Baltic, uh, which is still in the, in the defense business. The guns on, on uh, Langland Fort is exactly the same, but made by Skoda. Ooh, Pilsen. Yeah, but exactly the same gun. And here comes the ammunition out, uh, because they have to be careful. If, if something explodes out here, you get flash down in, in, in the elevator, and that could maybe set fire to the magazine. So you have the whole turret well underneath us, just like on the yes. ship? We will later come into the magazine below. And the red and green is just to indicate the sides, the slides are coming up, or...? And everything up here is, is made so we have an emergency system. You, you, normally the ammunition will come with the elevator, which is driven by electricity. But if that goes, you have this one, you can hoist up the grenades by that. And uh, the thing is, the tower can be moved by hand also, so there's a lot of emergency systems everywhere in, in, in such kind of equipment like this. Redundancy is a beautiful thing. Yeah. <laughs> and you have communications through yelling. Yeah. So the gun commander would be here had, yelling and keep. They had microphone and, and earpieces, but. Uh, this is fail proof. <laughs> <laughs> the backup. Until someone makes a hole in it. <laughs> and I think that's quite busy up here. Yeah, 15 people in this space, yeah. As the turret was rebuilt exactly the way the Germans had installed it, with everything inside, with any changes, there's a few things that stands out to me. One is, of course, the speaking tubes dating back to World War I, but the radiator. And you got to give them a little bit for creature comforts. And considering the ship originally did operate in some very cold temperatures up near Arctic or around Norway, that seems like a creature comfort that should be repeated and kept. Because the coastline out around Denmark does get very cold at times. There are lots and lots of underground tunnels here. 
just like you would expect from a World War II German fortress. I would imagine the Danes were a little bit inspired by the German technology of the time. Here are the ventilation shafts. Something interesting you will note on those are these grates. You recognize those? World War II German bunker grates. All being repurposed for this Cold War form. I'm guessing there's a place of this that's still active. Although I have not yet seen any signs telling me I can't go somewhere. I do love that. On top of one of the bunkers, there's the periscope. Well, this is definitely cold warp. It's a lot bigger than anything I've seen before. And you have a great view out to sea. Where in front of me is a little hole for the rangefinder. And there's a very fun story about the mines and the ferries and everything that was put to use. It was mine laying was the prime defense and the prime reason why this fort was here. And why the guns were here to protect the mine layers, defend against the Russian mine sweepers. This was the external fire control for visual direct observation. I'm just saying, this just looks like German World War II construction with a firing port. And you know what? I'm wrong. This was built by the Danish military in 1953. I will then say the Danes were very inspired by the German World War II way of doing things. So this is the main entrance to the tunnel system. Yeah. And of course you have big heavy doors. Yes. Courtesy to the German army. Probably it is because normally it would take a, a, a very, very big door here which could take the, the, the shock wave from, from the uh, nuclear charge. It was expected that there would be use some nuclear charges here at Stones and, and uh, that's why we had the fort here because uh, it was expected that it could withstand uh, a nuclear charge or something like uh, Hiroshima size, so maybe 50 kiloton or something like that. Uh, maybe not a direct hit, mm. but uh, so. such a door would be expensive and we had all this from, from, from the Germans. So I think that's why it was used. So how thick is the roof? Uh, when we come down in the fortress, it's about 18 to 20 meters. And here? Uh, here, I don't know how much uh, concrete is up here, maybe uh, two meters or something like that. That sounds unsafe. We better go downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's people standing up there, you never know. Of, 
of corridors like this and put a little dog out in, in, in 11 months. Uh, they started outside from the sea and uh, was digging into the, the, uh, the cliff. And then they took all the material and, and, and just threw it out in the water. So uh, the, the waves and the, the seawater took the material away. It's easy and the Russians and wouldn't easy. see the pile of, of, of dirt, so they exactly. wouldn't know what you're doing. But 11 months. That's not much. Fast. It's, it's very close to be one meter each hour. Right? That's fast. Hand or did we have a machine? Or? Uh, I think we have uh, pneumatic uh, equipment and they also made some, uh, some explosives, I think. Oh, the uh, good old fashioned way. But it is, it's, but that was the tools of it. It's not uh, drilled like uh, modern tunnels and that. And this is uh, not a garage. No, nope. <laughs> it's uh, a track for, for the shop. Where you, if, if you go to the door down there, it would come in here and be absorbed. Smash to the backboard and, and back to, towards itself, and then it would take some energy out of it. Get the rubber ball or something. This is a big institution. We're going to look this holiday. It's a little bit of a holiday. It's a holiday. It's a special holiday. It's a holiday. It's a holiday. I smell fuel. This was the main fuel storage. We're sloping upwards. Are we going up like five degrees? Yeah. There should be a few down here for totally up for three months for the, the great generators. And besides that, you're on the grid. And I'm guessing there's connecting tunnels underneath us. Uh, or no tunnels, only uh, pipelines. Uh, yeah. Down. Oh, yeah. And then you would fill this from something that went up? up. Yeah. yeah. It would take some time to fill this. I mean, you don't only have to... It only has to be filled once and then hopefully never again. Hopefully. <laughs> I mean, fuel would get old. You, I guess, you would. Every every couple of years, you would use it and then refill, or just. I don't know what it is, but maybe they have some filters to take out the water from it. Are they still full? You can see that the walls are grey, not glowing edges around here because normally this is in the dark. When I was here, the fort was was only walls of grey like this. Well, you didn't have candles, did you? Sorry? Did you have candles? Nope, uh, with some uh, battery lights uh, placed around. Oh. <laughs> These solar ones uh, are for, for emergency lights with batteries, and they're placed all over the fortress. And it, you know, it's really cool because I spend a lot of time traveling around tunnels that are very, very old and forts that are very, very old, where everyone who served there, well, they're dead. Yeah. You actually served here. Yeah, I did. Which is actually. <laughs> kind of cool. I actually get to see his port by somebody who's living okay, who was it's there. Okay, 40 years ago, but... <laughs>
But uh, the time I spent in the fort, I was on, on the, the antennas, uh, radar systems, uh, communication equipment and so on, the telephone equipment, maintaining it, repairing it, uh, whatever was necessary. And, and when we were having some exercise shootings, I was on duty uh, in the stationary radar in, in the underground. It was quite a job to keep that up running. Uh, it was very old system from 1943. Uh, it was uh, an uh, American uh, developed system made in 1943 for, for some uh, Pacific islands uh, for gunning out there. Uh, it was a mobile system, so uh, to keep the weight down, uh, the antenna was made by wood and plywood, so it was not very stable. It was actually very fragile, <laughs> you could say. This is a naval radio station, uh, but when I was here, they said hospital. Oh, uh, it was uh, well, about uh, 24 uh, beds, and there were two operation theaters in there, ready with, with lamps and, and, and a table, all that, ready for, for service within a few hours. And uh, down the corridor, with a lamp on, 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 the, on the wall down there. It's, today it says uh, it's dressing room for, for, for ladies because uh, women comes into, into the uh, Danish Navy about 81, 1981. But uh, when I was there, it was the, it said uh, chapel. It was where you could store those which didn't survive the reparations in there and you could store them down there until the fort was opened again, actually. And uh, this time, uh, the, the age of people down here was in the beginning of the 20s, so it was quite young people, actually. All these workstations are not touching the cliff anywhere, they're all independent. Yeah, that's to take the, the vibrations in case of a nuclear charge is detonating up on, on the top of the cliff. Sorry, it still smells a little bit like the hospital. <laughs> it does. It still do, yeah. Uh, this is the uh, complication room. It was a very secret place uh, because here you have the full overview of what is happening out in, in, in the uh, Baltic Sea. You can see what comes in of information from, from uh, the vessels out there, and uh, you send that information to, to the Headquarters of the Danish uh, Defense, you get information back what to do about it, when and where what. So you have the full picture of the war going on in here. And that's it by a secret. <coughs> and this uh, was all called war. Yeah. And, and you are in connection with the whole NATO from here. But this was this was only started in after you left. Yes, it was from, from 83 it was installed this. Because they take uh, the, the fortress as a coast fortress is uh, they they, they uh, turn it down actually and and then NATO says it would be a good idea to have a, a, a communication center here because we have a full overview. This is a, the front of the Cold War. <clears throat> it's a, one of the first places you can see uh, uh, an attack on the northern part of Europe coming in over the Baltic Sea. And that's why this was important uh, at that moment, because you had all this modern equipment. This is not that long ago. I mean, really, really it's, it's... The reason why they're using uh, these uh, teletype riders is that they are very stable. Uh, and you have these boxes, which is uh, the boxes, so that you can gather all what you are writing here, send it over to the receptor, and then they will make it back into uh, clear language. This was the coding machine. You put your message, this would transfer through, through you this. You just send that through that and then out by radio or by telephone line, whatever it is. And, and it's controlled by code with a change each 24 hours. So you only have 24 hours to try to break it. Uh, and if you do, it's, it's 
If you see some uh, mushrooms from, from uh, nuclear charges, you can uh, estimate the, large, uh, the size of the, the, uh, the charge from these cards. So these are nuclear oh, it weapons? Is to, it is to, to uh, <coughs> try to estimate the size of the nuclear charges used. When you have the, uh, the size of the mushroom, and then you can draw a line. Oh, yes. size from, from these yeah, this is a we weapon it's size. Yes, yes, but it's calculating uh, radiation and the possibility yeah. of the fallout and was a big part of these fallout shelters. Exactly. Because they had the, Denmark had a great civil defense system yes. that was set up for warning and protection of, of the infrastructure and for the civilians. Yes. We had a lot of bunkers and communication centrals in almost every medium-sized town. From the Cold War from 1949 to, to 1990 uh, is made about 1500 installations around in Denmark. But a large part of these is uh, precautions for, for the civilian people. Uh, food, uh, shelter, protection, uh, all that. In case of uh, attack from these blocks, uh, the situation would be that the, the war will going on in, in this area. Uh, the islands down here would be abandoned. Uh, we have minefields here, here and over here and down here too. Our surface waves and, and, and uh, submarines would be out here to, to, to take the first battles. Uh, but if they came into Zealand, uh, they, we, we know today that the, the, the Polish army would uh, land about 14,000 people or soldiers down here. They would use uh, nuclear charges as stones, uh, maybe also Roskilde and, and Holbeck and in Copenhagen a little later. Um, the next step would be to stop them in, in, in the, on a highway going down here at Zealand, the, the southern highway on Zealand, and, and that would be done with some uh, big wires uh, that would be caught by, by the bills of, of the uh, tanks and our own uh, panzer troops would, would be uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in place up here along the way and, and shoot on them from the side where they have the same, same uh, armor. That was the idea about it. But all the, the, the civil people would be moved from, from this part of Zealand to this part of Zealand. And, uh, that was done by, by uh, a special arrangement where the, the total defense of Denmark, that was all that could go into the defense. It was not only the Navy and, and then the Air Force and the Army, it was also police forces, uh, emergency... Uh, home Guard. Uh, home Guard, whatever, all home. that would go into it. But they would use private vehicles, uh, personal, Personal uh, cars and, and lorries, whatever they could use, they would be uh, actually a transcript of all of this. What is called a subscript from, uh, from the uh, Ministry of Defense. You would get a letter, you should place your car there, uh, give them the key, and they would paint it green and use it for something. And that could be used for evacuation of the civil people down here. And, and there was also an other special arrangement with, with uh, many people in, in the, the public services, uh, like teachers, uh, postmen, whatever. Uh, they had a special contract, uh, and that made it possible to, to order them to drive these vehicles because all the, the uh, army people, navy and so on, they would be out in, in, in the battle, but, but all these civilian people could then make all these evacuation and uh, transportation of ammunition and whatever it could be. Most of these people didn't actually know what their, their, their task would be in the case of attack. Uh, they just knew that they should do something. They're so clean, I'm not used to it. <laughs> have you seen them? <laughs> have you seen the World War II Museum in Poland? It doesn't make a difference. No, You're still coming out wet. <laughs> So 
So this is the emergency generator room. And despite this was really well constructed and certainly does look sturdy enough to take a few impacts, they did put a little braces just on the side of the tunnels, just in case something needed to be fixed. And okay, got her. down memory lane of Danish food, we have more hallways to walk. So this is a square gun well, not a round cannon well. I guess it doesn't have to be round down here. So is this, this is how the, the guys got up there. We got the, the, the tower up there. And... Up these stairs. What about the munition then? Oh, it's in here. The ammunition storage is in, in two parts. One for the propeller charges, which is more uh, sensitive than the grenades are. And then you have grenade storage in here. That's what you can see there. They're placed in one pair, one grenade, one propeller charge. And then they go up. Where's up? The first uh, platform you meet. On the oh, so they roll in and then up? Yeah. And then you uh, take the lower so you, Second generator which is transporting them up to, to the tower and so Oh yeah. Interesting. You prepare six six grenades each minute. Where did you get the shells after the war? Did, did the Germans keep making them? Did we make it? Did we have enough? Uh, it was made by the Danish uh, Nazi. Okay. So we just made more of our own shells? Yeah. Or the German shells. The, the, the blue ones is actually exercise uh, uh The grey ones are, are for uh, arm, armor piercing uh, ammunition. And this is uh, these grenades are exploding exactly when you hit the ship. And the green 
ones are actually for light. You have about 500 grenades in here. And then if you calculate how long can we shoot with 500 grenades and six shots each minute, it gives us something like one hour and 20 minutes. That's not much. No. And you couldn't do that because then the barrels would overheat and be damaged. Uh, but again, this ammunition is for 48 hours. And these are inert? These are dead, they're just they are dead. totally inert all of it, yeah. So, what, what then? Were there a munition supply of storage outwards or outside? You couldn't get it in. Some spare ammunition corridors, but again, this is needed 48 hours for, for the mobilization of, of, of NATO to get a shore in, in Pittsburgh and, and, and then reinforce the Danish defense. Yeah. Was this for carrying or was that for the fuse? Uh, no, it's because, because the, uh, the armor piercing grenades have a back part detonator. You can't sit in there because they're just piercing the, the, uh, the armor on the shield. So it has to be placed backwards here. Oh. Do you see it? Is it there? This is, this is for the, uh, the armor piercing grenades. So this was, was a timed fuse? It would uh, penetrate yeah, it it's, it's, shot? It's uh, timed by about a few hundred. Uh, Hundred parts, hundred, uh, hundred parts of, of, of a second. It just has to go through the, the armor and then yeah. it's, it is detonating. should go down the, the uh, elevator or something like that. And that's why they are placed in a bunker inside the bunker to protect them. And you have this door also where you are just taking out the propellant charges you need. You are not uh, piling them up somewhere. Uh, piling of propellant charges and ammunition was uh, one thing that caused about 300 losses in, in, in the Battle of, of, uh, of Jutland. Within a few hours. Yes. Uh, another interesting thing is that what you can see here is original German ammunition. Original German World War II yeah. issue. The steel case. The steel case. And the Danish version manufactured in, 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 uh, in the Danish uh, uh, ammunition arsenal. So it's brass. The they are a bit younger, that's actually uh, cork. That's cool. But it's a brass shell. Yeah. And the German ones are just steel. Yes. Cheaper and easier than brass. So I see different colors. Grey, green. Yeah. And then when they're going to be used to you have this, uh, you have to open it, take out the propellant charts, take it out to the elevator, just to protect it because it's that sensitive. We don't want any fire or any explosions in here because if, if this storage is, is blown up, it could take the grenades with it and then you have a bit of an explosion. So, is there a difference between the grey and the green? I think the, the grey ones would be used first for, for exercises. Uh, this is more for more ammunition. And then down there you have uh, some small boxes that's for the 40 mm Bullfox gun. Were they stored here back then? Uh, no. I didn't, yeah. Separate storage for, for those. Yeah, I figured they would just be sitting. That's a very good gun. Well, it's a very good Swedish export ship. Yeah. <laughs> the 40 mm Bullfox is still in use today. So again, two days worth of fighting. Yeah. And this is, what is that? What? Oh, that's the just an ammunition elevator copy. It's a cradle for, for the uh, elevator. So you put two in there? Or? Yes, you would have two charges on each. Oh. each four and then four propellants underneath. No? no for the propellant charge. The, the, but for the propellant here and then the charge. Yeah. Okay. Training and it's cheap as a shooter. Yeah. Exercise. Yeah. The crew. 
And then you can see, so that's the star on the side. So there's the exact same on the other side? On the other side you have the, the, the back part, the uh, cotton barrel of the tower. German technology right here. Yeah, it's in the gas filters. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's uh, doing by an electric motor, but you have to wind it up because it takes a lot of, of uh, yeah. revolution, so you had to wind it up by hand and then start the motor. But th this is World War II, isn't it? This, this is the jump. Yeah, you could also hand crank it if you can't get the, if you don't have the power. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of that equipment is made by the German uh, manufacturer Dreger. Leftover from the war and oh, why not? the war and yeah. today they make uh, timeless equipment. And of course. It's always fun when you see stuff that's reused. <laughs> and this is another funny, funny thing because this is the emergency uh, energy for, for the gun up there. It's pressurized air. As, that's also a way to store energy. And today you use batteries, but the Germans would rather like to use their batteries in, in the submarines. So this is a compressor and you press up the, these bottles to about 200 atmospheres and then you can, uh, with, the, uh, with the pressurized air, you can drive a, a small, uh, like a steam engine up in, in the signal platform to, to drive the hydraulic pumps. Oh. Instead of just having an electric motor that you use to compress it for it. So there's one more step before you have to hand crank it. Exactly. And the other side was a red elevator, so you know what what comes up from what side. Speaking tube for the ammunition coming up. Yeah. Over pressure, just look like World War II. And you know the company that makes these yes, from the war is still working today, doing yes. roughly the same thing. Because they also made the ones for the East Wall in the 30s. Yes. There's always been the misnomer that is the big, strong countries, America, Britain, France, Russia, that built these huge installations for defense or fighting or missiles. But the smaller countries, in the Scandinavian countries, or Switzerland, built some amazing fortresses because, well, quite frankly, they were smaller and needed more firepower to hold out. This is a nice hallway yeah. with nice walk. Was, it, was this how it was laid when it was... No, uh, it's in the way Okay, because I thought the bricklaying is a really nice touch. You know, and this corridor is totally about 300 meters and separated with two runs from each other. And it could be locked up with armored doors on both ends. Yes, it's about armored doors And then you have angles uh, to avoid the... Uh, from an internal office corridor, but also to, to take off some energy. It's a shock rate to go down into the forces. Yeah. This is a Okay. And all the green is algae or moss? Does it keep growing? Yes. So in like 20 years, it's going to be really interesting. It's going to be furry on the walls. So you can have a rainforest down here at some point. <laughs> well, a cold rainforest. What is it, 10 degrees down here? Close enough.
We're having an interesting conversation about how the tile was laid ever so crooked, so obviously it was done by people from the capital. <laughs> And you find me a country where you don't think the people in the capital are a little strange, right? So there's beds here as well? Yeah. The gun crew? Oh, the radar. Okay, so they were here, and the radars and equipment. So, I see turret number two, I see a sign. Yeah, all this equipment is from the gun lane uh, of the two gun towers. And then this is a main computer, it's a mechanical analog computer. Uh, where you are making all the basic calculations. You are putting in uh, some wind speed, uh, wind direction, air temperature, humidity, uh, temperature of, of, of the propellant charge and, and how many shots has been fired and so on. And this is made by some naval seamen standing here and they are just turning these and then you can lock them. And then you're connected to a lot of, of uh, gears and, and, and all that, but you have some uh, conical metal pieces in there which you can turn and, and displace. And that's actually the, the uh, program data for, for all these calculations. It's not, uh, it's not a read-only memory or something like that, it's all mechanical. When was this built? It's from 1948 and it's made by... Uh, a company called Holland's Signal. It's actually Thales today who's making some signals for the trains in Jutland and, and made the, the baby's payment cards. And, and this was in use for the entire time? There was never any computers for the guns or...? It's just a computer. This is the computer? <laughs> yeah. And then they had to calculate the, uh, the uh, data for, for the target. To calculate uh, the speed and, and course to uh, get to uh, get the point where the grenade and the ship will meet up there, actually. And this is these consoles over here. This is calculating the speed and, and the duration of the target together with the two optical sides. You can, you can make some calculation of direction and, and, and distance, but if you take the movement into it, you can calculate the speed and course also. This was not very far from World War II technology. No, I mean, this pretty much is World War II technology. Most of this technology actually was, was uh, existing in the First World War uh, as the first generation of it. In 1953, when the photos were ready, the Americans uh, said, oh, well, now we'll bring these photos in. We have some radar equipment which was made from, from uh, the, the uh, American Navy during World War II in 1943, and that was uh, put out on some islands in the Pacific Ocean uh, to direct some guns out there. Uh, this is a part of it, it's a B scope where you have the target in here, and then you can place this one over the splashes which can be seen on the radar. When the grenade is splashing into the sea, you, you, you can see it on the radar. So you can see how far are you from hitting the target. And in this case, you can see where are we? Are you too long, too short? So, did it work? Backward. Yes, and then you have the spot correction over here, uh, where you can make very small corrections of the gun. But this was an uh, improvement of the photos because now you could, you could shoot in the dark without using the light grenades, you could use it uh, when it was raining and in, 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 in fog. But these radars were made uh, in a very short time uh, and they were just put together of, of what they had. You can see this is not the, the, the same mechanics uh, as this. Uh, the antenna was very light because it was a movable system. It was made and wood, by wood and, and, and plywood, actually. Uh, 
to protect it, it was necessary to make a shaft down here where you could hoist the antenna, substitute a, 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 a armored plate, hoist up the antenna, make some target uh, finding and following, down with the antenna, over with the, the armored plate again, because it was made by wood. Uh, as the Americans said, when you can use it and throw it out when you get something which is better and more uh, suitable for the use. Uh, but that never happened. This equipment was in use until the forts closed in 2000. So you have the guns from 1936 from the Nazi Germany, you have radar equipment made by wood. Uh, in, in, from 1943, you have the mechanical computer from 1948 and that is used to protect these minefields out there, which is protecting Zealand from invasion from, from the Warsaw Pact up to the year 2000, when the Cold War actually is decided to be over. It ends in 1990, but in 2000 we closed down the fort. This is a museum piece. This this. It is more. <laughs> it is, this is like, I mean, uh, what was this an evolution of what they had on the ice? Well, well, this is the only part which is back uh, from, from this system. Uh, I'm sure with the room where the stationary radio, radio was placed, but it was old equipment. It was with uh, valves and relays. Uh, it was sensitive to everything. And we used a lot of time on repairing it and getting it up to, to, to the standard it should be used for. When, when there were shootings, we maybe had 20 minutes before we had something to do and adjust them on the equipment to get it with. Then the antenna wouldn't stop where the shoot and then we would often make some uh, rob these uh, contacts clean and all that stuff. It was, it was simply too old at that time too. Der var det ikke Det er jo ikke sådan, fordi det sidder særligt tæt, hvor det sidder over til en anden. Cold War Defense of Denmark. Yeah. Best technology of World War One. Oh, this is so cool. 4,000, 4,000 volts. Where the hell are you going to kick 4,000 volts from? Probably from the, from the scope. Uh, but in a modern television equipment, it's something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Buy one and turn it into a beer fridge. <laughs> Electronics modules. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And the valves are 807. It's uh, very common used in uh, modern uh, hi fi equipment. <laughs> 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 Your command center. It was so hot, just the shooting. I thought I saw a little bit. Yes. Air condition. Yes. You have the radio uh, communication room in here, and it was very secret, so you had to put out the signals out and then deliver them in here. Yeah, because the door would be locked because you couldn't just have everybody in here. That was a restricted area. Ooh. Big door. Yeah. So this was the actual command central. Yes, at that time the line was on the fort. Then we have a large manual plotting table. And that plotting table is actually on the on the fort on Langeland today. Here's the other museum fort. Is that a sister fort to here or is it just is does it look the same? Uh, no, this this 
on the space of the guns which is uh, naval guns. Uh, the other uh, long is, is from the cruiser's for the space we just have been in. Yeah. Substation for, for communication with all these different channels to so civilian ships, military ships, the tactical, the tactical communication, all that. It must be interesting for you to see it like this after having worked here. <laughs> yeah, I it's mean, a bit different. It's like you worked in a place that's now a museum. That, that's... You can see there's still some uh, labels on. This would be the modern equivalent of a server room. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, it wasn't in the city there, but where they had the, uh, the uh, very short wave uh, transceivers for, for tactical communication. Again, air condition. This is actually a little Places in this world they're still in use today. I'll bet you I can find places in America where they're in use today. That could be. In here we had a station there, uh, we had two weather seats. One was mobile and placed on the top in a, in a container. It could be moved out in the, in the landscape. And in here we had the station there. And it was uh, together with the console, we saw with a B scope, uh, it was an A scope we had here, yeah, and, and all the equipment for the antenna up at the surface, stairs in there, and you can see even the facing on fresh. <laughs> Center for the spider cave from <laughs> hell. Maybe too, but then they put uh, it up here, and then they could move the uh, armored plate, and then they could hoist the antenna. Whoa! This is the antenna room. Yes, up, up, up. 
Was that the wooden antenna or the other one? Yes, it was a wooden antenna. This was the wooden antenna. Yeah. The, the range finder. This or is a small platform over there and you can normally these uh, the, by hand, of course, by winding uh, around to move the uh, armor plate. And, and repair the, the plywood. And another handle to, to hoist the antenna. And repair the plywood. Yeah, okay. I've been up there a lot of times. So what was your duty station here? To keep the uh, radars running, actually. So we had to maintain all the uh, radio equipment, radars, whatever was, uh, TV equipment of any kind. I mean, it is a little bit funny that you, you think about you're part of the radar operations unit and you sometimes have to go fix it with hammer and, and wood. Yeah. <laughs> what is this? This is a guard post oh. for the entrance. Post defense post. From the sea. Yes, I recognize. This must be. Yeah, that's. No? Yeah, that is. This is one of them. Is that German? It doesn't look, I mean, that mechanism doesn't look German, there should be a slide. I can't tell. But that's where, I was wondering where the overpressure. What a gift, what a gift. I'm dead of plastic. And this was purely for the construction. So was there somebody permanently stationed there for defense or? One of the most boring places in the biggest defense in the two hours. Two hours? Oh, that's not much. So I suppose this is what you call a utility tunnel. Yes, I think you have. I still have uh, the, uh, the tube for the Geiger counter. Really? That's for the Geiger counter? Because that's the, uh, the main ventilation system that comes in there and there's some nuclear waste on Of course, this is where it would be.
this is more like what I'm used to. <laughs> I just do the most romantic holidays. stored. <laughs> I mean, it's just, then it becomes a time capsule somehow. It is a time capsule. It is. And since this fortress was constructed before women actually entered the Chinese Navy, well, the bathroom facilities are a little bit more, well, shall we say, public. So this is the other gun pit that is pretty much looks like the way you guys left it. Well, you didn't you didn't retire here at the fort. No. Nope. You it retired after you. Yes, it's, <laughs> it was closed down in two thousand. When did you get out of the service? Yeah. 
For peacetime duty of those on service here, they would receive their foods and rations upstairs in the kitchen. There was also barracks and everything else above ground where they would go up and come back down. However, from time to time there would be week-long drills where everybody would be called up and had to stay and live on rations here for a week to force train and experience, and it builds camaraderie when you're locked up with somebody for over a week. Believe me. So this is the old magazine, which is <laughs> so cold my camera can't see it. And that was for the fuses. On the east side, they had the Warsaw Pact and, and the North Atlantic Treaty uh, called NATO, uh, with uh, US, Canada, and uh, UK, and, and other Western countries. But first, in, in, in 1949, Denmark was a part of it because what a bit was a bit nervous about the the Russian neighbors. What would they think if we joined NATO? And you have to remember that uh, the Danish island Bornholm was was uh, still under uh, Russian occupation until 1946, April or 1946 actually. So it was very short time from 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 uh, the Russians had left Danish ground uh, to be decided to go into the. Uh, NATO alliance uh, in 1949, and then it was a part of the Cold War. Uh, in, and so one of the first things that were made in in, in Danish defense was that we built some uh, air stations around, and and we had uh, to build these fortresses uh, at Stones and and uh, uh, Langeland Fort at Great Belt. Uh, and the reason for this was that, that uh, we expected an invasion of, uh, in, in the Danish waters uh, from uh, the Warsaw Pact, and they could uh, invade uh, Danish ground. And uh, to avoid this, we had to have surface vessels, we had submarines out in the Baltic, but we would also lay a lot of mines, sea mines, uh, out in the the sound out here, and, and we would uh, in the base of, of Kø and Bay of Fax. Uh, and then we had uh, the uh, Great Belt, uh, which would be uh, powdered over the mines, uh, and the same, and the distance between Bornholm and Fremont, there would be laid mines. And there was a great number of mines, it was thousands of mines that would be put out there and they were placed in, in, in big depots uh, up at, at, at Kø, north of the fort, and south in, in Vemetofte, uh, there was a, a big mine depots. And then these mines would be put out in the water uh, as fast as possible actually. Uh, 
it was not allowed to have mines out in, 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 in peacetime. Uh, it's, it's a war uh, handling. Uh, declaration of war. Yeah, uh, declaration of war actually. If you have mines out in, in, in uh, international waters, you have free navigation. Uh, so uh, we had very few hours to put all these mines out there, and we had uh, four mine layers which would take about 400 mines uh, each. Uh, that was made arrangement with uh, the Danish rail ferries uh, around in the country, uh, and the mines were placed on, on a small dolly where you had the same distance between the wheels and as on a railroad wagon, and therefore you could roll all these mines aboard the, the railroad ferries uh, and use them in the mine laying out there. So, and, and then you have a lot of capacity to put mines out in, in the Sound and in the Great Belt. And there was la made uh, reinforced uh, harbors in, in, in Kø and in, in uh, Faxe Ladeplads uh, to take all these bigger ships. And normally it was just small fishing harbors. And then we could lay all these mines within something like 10 to 12 hours. This was the, the calculated time for it. And, and in, in that uh, moment when we imagine that now we are, we are attacked, then we start this mine laying operation together with the operation to, to, to take up and, and, and stop them out in, in uh, the Baltic Sea with uh, surface vessels and submarines. Of course, the, uh, the Germans would participate in these operations. Uh, what the Swedes would do is not quite clear for the moment, but uh, it's under investigation what they actually had intended to do in case uh, of a breakout of the Cold War. So when you built the fort, this is where everything. When you built the fort, this is where everything came down. All the equipment came down here, and when it was uh, modernized, all the old equipment was taken off by this shaft. Uh, where we are standing now, the, the sun had not been shining for something like 64 million years. And what you can see is, is all these layers in the field. The field is made by other uh, animals and species than, than the, the other part of it. So each of these lines of field is representing a climatic change actually. Yeah. And just below here we, we have a, the, 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 the very uh, famous fish clay uh, where you can see uh, some uh, rest of, of this uh, meteor which was uh, dumping down somewhere in Mexico in the bay over there. Uh, and which is meant to, to, uh, to be the end of the dinosaur, dinosaur dinosaurs. Uh, and that's just Half a meter below here, actually. 64 million years. Well, this is your emergency exit. It's, it's uh, made uh, of <laughs> steel up there with a lot of concrete above it. Well, it's an emergency. No one said it was <laughs> going to be easy. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. And all 
private beach. Yay, there's an actual out. Oh, oh this is nice. This is so nice and warm. I'm not saying it's cold or chilly in there in any which way, but it's cold and chilly in there, trust me. Oh, this is nice. So, would you guys, when you were stationed here, would you come out here and have a smoke? Or just, I would imagine this will be the, the hangout. So, was this ever any smoke? Anything? Was this ever used for anything? They uh, transported all the chalk and flint out there. So was there a little mini rail here? Yeah. Or? Wouldn't this be like a, a back door for the Russians to sneak in here? One morning when they came out here, and I was placed a bottle of vodka out here from, from the Russians. During the Cold War? Yeah. And they That's have, funny. They have climbed the cliff and they have uh, made some uh, signatures up there to I mean, a lot of the Cold War was like that. It exactly. was a little bit, hey, we were yeah. here. I have been, I've seen pictures from taken from the base group of a new boat, which you can't imagine. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Igen igen. Det gør de der vel ikke for noget. Det kan de der vel ikke finde på. So... This was the fire control. Ja, yeah, for the optical side. On top of the bunker. Huh. There's still light in it. Be lost, maybe. Oh, and you have the optical side. So you laid the guns optically here. Yeah. Was there a connection between here and the... Uh, and the artillery sensor, yes. No, I was thinking, was there, uh, was there a connection between here and the Hawk batteries? No, not at all. You didn't nothing, have any... Nothing to do with the Hawks. No communication? I mean, you asked for communication. Yeah, there had been some communication from the operation, uh, but, but not with all No, No mutual support or fighting support? No. Nope. I mean, they were dealing with planes. It was, yeah, and it was based on the radars. defend the minefields placed in uh, in the Ur Sound and, and, and in Great Belt with two fortresses placed here on stones and uh, on Langeland, uh, uh, just below Funen. Of course they uh, asked what we would equip them with and then uh, we had a good explanation. We had some very fine uh, guns from uh, the German Battleship Gneisenau, which uh, was uh, actually sunk uh, in, in a Polish harbor uh, after they have removed the guns, and the guns should be used for, for the, the uh, Atlantic uh, forces that Hitler was building up uh, along the Europe uh, western coast and Norway. <coughs> and the guns particularly uh, at Stones was placed at Fanø, uh, the Espia harbor. But when it was decided to build the fortress, uh, we had to uh, 
to pay for it ourselves. Uh, the, the NATO infrastructure fund wouldn't pay anything for it. Uh, and we took the guns over from uh, Fane to, to, uh, to Stones and some guns from the northern part of Fune uh, to the Langlands fort. Uh, the manuals had been thrown away, uh, so actually it took some years to, to dismantle them and, and uh, put them over here and, and, and uh, put them together again. Uh, they started with one gun, dismantled it, transported it over here, integrated it and made it to work by looking at the other guns still standing on Fanø. Uh, and after that they could take the second gun over here, get it to work by looking at the first gun they placed here. But that means that in 1955 the, the guns were ready for, for actual service. And in all these years uh, the fort has been uh, manned uh, 24 hours a day all year round. Uh, there was constantly about 30 people on duty in the operation room, uh, four hours of duty, four hours of rest, four hours of duty, four hours of, of rest, and that was in uh, 72 hours, and they went home and had free for, for about a week, and then they went back again, 72 hours of duty, all the years from, from 1953 to uh, it was closed down in 2000. And when you left here, it didn't look the way it looks now. The, the Hawk batteries no, came after? The, the Hawk batteries came uh, after I, I left the fort. I left the fort in, in the beginning of uh, 81. And uh, we had some trials with the radars from the Air Force. Uh, and it was prepared to, to make uh, the new operation room in, in the old hospital down in the underground. There was a hospital with uh, 24 beds and two operating theaters uh, prepared uh, for instant use, actually. Uh, if the fort is closed down, uh, it could be closed down up to 30 hours, uh, 30 days. Uh, you couldn't get out, you couldn't get in, except if you should have some spares or something like some more important things, but you couldn't get out to get a stroll or get some fresh air or something like that. That was not allowed. So you had uh, everything needed to, to, to maintain the operation of the fortress inside the fortress, which also meant the hospital and uh, you had a, a special accommodation for, for, for the bodies that didn't. Uh, survived the uh, repair at the doctors actually. So uh, we have everything down there. The Hawk missile system began development already in 1952 as a ground to air missile ordered by the US Army. The launcher was developed by Northrop and the missile by Raytheon. It went into service in 1959. A little later that week, while filming a completely different fort in Denmark, I just happened to run into another one of the soldiers who served at the fort, and I wanted to get his story. These things always happen in small countries. We were at, at, at Stevens Fort to, to protect Denmark from, from the Russian uh, in, uh, in Køgebogt. So we were, we were guarding Zealand uh, 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 as, as soldiers. So you were the close, of, close defensive perimeter? Yes, yes. And against air and, and, and land? Air and land, and, and uh, especially from, from the sea. And th there, was, there was some uh, radar rooms in, uh, in the basement, uh, about uh, 50 meters below uh, ground. So uh, I was a part of that, that the defense system with, with radars. We, we were uh, monitoring uh, boats from ships, uh, from from Russia, from, uh, yes, the other side. All, all the cannons were, were outdated and the radar were outdated and uh, uh, f f the whole defense system and our weapon was outdated too. It was from, uh, I think, First World, World War. It was a Garant Gewehr. We were using that, that time, so, so it, it was outdated. So what was the plans if the Russian actually landed? <laughs> I don't know. Probably throw the key away to the to the basement. 
I heard the Russians played a couple of tricks on you guys. They would sneak up on the coast and leave little yes, messages. Yes, and, and tried our, our, our radar system, yes. If, if we uh, could see them or we could monitoring them. So uh, I think we could, but uh, they tested us a lot of times. They liked uh, the, the pals I had there and I were, what do you call it? I was, I was drafted when I was in the police about 20 years later. I was, no, 10 years later, I was drafted for, for my second time. That was fun to see all the, the pals again and uh, yeah, we had some beers and... and, and, and yeah. So you're in the Navy, not the Army? No, it's it's the navy. Yes, you're the navy. Yeah. So you have the good food. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> you always do. Yeah. And it's easy to see why somebody could be fooled to think this was a German World War II Regelbauten, especially using the same grade, right? Now, if I've ever seen something that looked like World War II German construction, this really is it. I know there was nothing here before they started building for the Cold War. This just looks very German, or very German design. I am a little curious. You've got firing ports in both directions, front and aft, almost a little bit like I see in the Czech Republic. I'm guessing close defensive perimeter of the main area inside. Curious though. Fortunately, not all the radars for the big guns were on plywood sticks. There's one above ground mobile command center radar station that could be deployed wherever needed and sometimes out of harm's way. And a command post. CP truck. That's actually very interesting. Maps, the telex, lights, I work around the clock. Well, we are in Denmark, just in case you hadn't figured it out. Remember, a lot of this revolved around launching missiles at intruding aircraft and monitoring skies. And of course the waterways, since we are on the coast. Or the fire control. That's really cool to see, and you have a lot of really nice displays here. And it's interesting to see, if you look at this, Cold War is really not that far away. And how much technology has changed since. Although this will probably last longer than most of the modern electronics we're using today. Oh, this memories this brings back. I knew how to... I was trained on this thing. I knew how to drive it. Well, sort of, because I managed to uh, blow the engine on one cracked it in an intersection down in south of Denmark. But I do like them. And this is not a Pop 40 I'm taking it. Well, is it? Of course it knows. And what I love here about the Danish Army displays is here are three of my favorite things in the world in one place. This is the one Jeep I really would want. Not the silly new AMG fancy crap they drive around Beverly Hills. The real military Jeep. And of course you have the motorcycle, which is awesome in itself. And my favorite toy that I always wanted mounted on my balcony. Quad 4. Yes. Must have. Must have. Must have. One of the things I really always wanted to fire. There's still hope. In the evolution of forts over the past thousand years, there are so many common denominators that the early developers of fortress designs just had to put in back then. You still see the keys are still in use today, 
just like they were all the way through World War I to World War II to the Cold War. Certain components just keep repeating themselves, obviously from air, food storage, armaments, munitions and safe handling of the same, but it is a fascinating journey of how the constructions differ yet remain the same, and we are only just beginning. Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebmus nuclear reactor. Over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, uh, my PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.